uh, here today. Uh, he's uh, an assistant professor from Columbia University uh, and in the Department of Statistics. Um, <coughs> so uh, his, his PhD was in, in the Department of Statistics and Probability at Michigan State University. Uh, he's one of the students. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave him to uh, describe some of his uh, research interests. Uh, <coughs> what he's talking about today is about uh, uh, some of the work that he's doing with uh, our colleagues over at uh, City College, uh, uh, Mr. Neil Tanya and Mr. Lee. Uh, so it's uh, something very related also to a lot of stuff that you guys are doing. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go get started. Uh, uh, welcome. Okay, so <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cho, for inviting me and also for the introduction. So, so the talk is, uh, so this project is essentially my first attempt to do uh, spatial temporal uh, demand estimation of transportation type data sets. So for me, this is like a starting point to learn a little bit more about the subject that you guys are uh, expert in and try to understand a little bit more. <coughs> and as mentioned, this joint work with uh, Mr. Kamil Kamga, Mr. Sandeep, Fabian Bahman at uh, City College. So I'll start uh, a little bit explaining about the data set, which I'm, I'm sure uh, many of you have heard of it and have used it in your own uh, projects. And I'll talk a little bit more about the methodology, the specific uh, statistical model that we picked. We picked three uh, models var star and g star. So we're gonna explain in details what they mean, what are the differences, what are the advantages of each of them against the others. <coughs> and then we're gonna apply uh, these d different models to the data sets, which are essentially the demand or the pickups of the yellow cab uh, at New York City. And then I have put a little bit, uh, something that goes beyond the title of the talk, but I, I feel it's, it's, uh, it's very important to mention that uh, many of the, of the papers and the projects that I see in the literature, they, they sort of work or focus on the assumption of a stationarity on the model, uh, which uh, may or may not be true in different data sets. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that case that what if that does not happen? How can we, or how much can we go beyond a stationarity and, can, and still do some sort of uh, statistical inference. So I'll, then I'll mention about future, uh, uh, many, many future works that are possible. Like I said, this is a f starting point. So there are many, many more projects to be done. And if you're interested, we can talk after this. So, all right, so as we know, there are different types of uh, public transportations, specifically in, in, a, in a large city like New York. And uh, so some of them are, and you can imagine demand is related to human behavior and human behavior has huge amount of uncertainty. So it makes it really complicated. And that's exactly where I got interested into this problem. How can you understand this behavior and how can you understand the dynamics of this human uh, behavior? Uh, some of some of these, like subway or bus, they a little bit simplify this problem by having some specific schedules, and try and ask for the customers or the people to adjust their schedules to to theirs. But but the rest of them, uh, specifically the yellow cabs, they have their own variability plus the demand, which could be you know curbside uh, side pickups and. That makes the problem even more complicated. So that's gonna add additional variability. And for a statistician like me, that's exactly where I got, where I get you know, more and more interested about. So how can I explain the variability of demand for these sort of data sets, specifically for yellow cap, because the vari variability is somehow maximized over all these. So, <coughs> so the taxi demand, will depend on many, many different factors. Human behavior is starting point. The weather, specific events, uh, work, uh, road closures, right? And many, many different things might affect. And 
This is just if you just take one snapshot, one specific location, one specific time. And just imagine that you have all these variabilities and all these parameters that are affecting the demand, the, the demand through time and through space, okay? So here, for example, in two, so the data set that we worked is a 2015 data set. So it's a project for maybe a year and, or a year and a half back. So I, I believe new data sets are available. So what, whatever we are working here could be extended to those data sets as well. And I have here the daily data set. So, and as you can see over time, in every day we have from 100, 150, uh, thousand to, to <coughs> almost 600k pickups and it has huge amount of variability over time so even if you work with this very very bad aggregation which is daily it's still you would see variability and and understanding this variability over time is is of interest Um, <clears throat> another part of variability that specifically I am interested in is the spatial variability. So, so you, you see that's a, sam a snapshot of the pickup locations for one specific day, the day that we actually um, took. It was a typical day, and we focused our methodology on, on one or two days, but it could be extended to, to multiple days if you allow a little bit of adjustment to your model. I will talk about it at the end of the talk. But as you can see, huge amount of variability. And <clears throat> so we have five different boroughs, and then you could count how many pickups we had in each of them. And, and again, this is again a really bad aggregation, right? You could just zoom in into maybe zip codes or uh, TAD or different types of uh, spatial zoning system and try to count on each of them how many um, uh, pickups we had and then try to understand that variability. So, so there are two sorts of variability, spatially and temporally, and that is exactly why we are choosing a spatial temporal modeling framework to understand this dynamic and this behavior. Okay. So as you can see, you could easily do a, a randomness test here and understand that these are not IID. So there's definitely a dependence temporal dependency structure, which means essentially I could, I could use the current data and the past data to say something about the future. And that's exactly the pur one of the purposes here. <clears throat> okay, so, so like I said, um, starting at this slide, you could go many, many different directions. You could think of counts as only zero and ones, so you just do the number of counts, and they become discrete random variables. Right? You have 10 pickups, you have 20 pickups, you have 100 pickups. Or if they are large enough, you could somehow treat them as continuous random variables. Okay, so it's a trick that uh, has been there in the statistics of many, many different disciplines for many years. If you don't like it, you can take log, and then eventually now everything is actually, in fact, continuous. So, so that's exactly one of the things that we, do, that we uh, did here. And <clears throat> another thing is about the, the aggregations, right? Uh, so you could think each pickup as an occurrence of a new event, and we have different models for that. But what, what I'm interested here is to do a real-time prediction of maybe an hour later, half an hour later, two hours later. And since that is my interest, instead of going with that direction, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna do aggregation over time and over space. So I'm not gonna look at each specific time, but instead every 10 minutes, every five minutes, every half an hour, I'm gonna count how many pickups we had. And then again, I'm gonna zoom in to a spatial zoning system that I have I think we, what we choose was just the zip codes, but, but then again, you could go way beyond that system. You could even think about uh, somehow an optimal uh, sampling design system that could give you the best possible uh, you know, prediction performance. But, but like I said, this is like the starting point for me. 
So what, what we did here, I think it was like a 15 minutes aggregation over time and zip codes for the locations. I just want to mention something that this, this is a publicly available data. Uh, you all know that much better than me. And there are like many, many different features for each. So we have the pickup location, we have the drop-off location, even the amount of tip, the amount of, you know, there are like many, many things. How, how um, <coughs> far was the trip? So we have different types of variability as you can see, less than one mile or goes up all the, uh, all the way to more than 10 miles. So, so these are the different scopes of the data set that I'm not even bringing into the, to the model. But of course, if, if those are the question of interest, then one could start bringing those and this is gonna make the, the model more complicated and uh, the interpretation also a little bit more demanding. So that's why uh, we skipped this sort of uh, information, but of course they are available in the data. All right, so, so the objective is uh, that I wanna model the demand for taxis as a dynamic special temporal process. Uh, so that was my motivational slides on why spatial is important, why temporal is important. So we have highly disaggregated GPS enabled data set, which we do a couple of data, step, data mining uh, steps to make it to, to the data set that we like. But so that's the raw data. We do something on it to make it the data set that we want so we could fit the data that uh, fit, fit uh, to the model that we want. And so there's a little bit of amount of information that is lost once you start doing aggregation. Okay, so, but instead we would try to find methods that are gonna give us the best sort of prediction performance, at least on, on the framework of this specific model that we are interested in. So we accommodate for that loss through efficient implementation. And as you're gonna see in the next few slides, <coughs> we have huge number of parameters. And huge number of parameters is sort of equivalent to overfitting. And overfitting means bad prediction. So we need to do something about it. What we have picked here are is a penalized methods try to set some of the parameters to zero. So essentially uh, project to a very specific subspace that in that subspace we could actually do better type uh, prediction. And of course, like in any statistical model and framework, you need to check for goodness of fit and, and also check the, predict the out of sample prediction performance, which uh, we did and we'll see in a few slides later. Okay, so like I said, I'm not an expert in this area, so I just did a little bit of research and there are like many, many papers on this subject. I'm mentioning only a few. So if you're interested in doing discrete type um, analysis, we have Poisson, we have negative binomial, we have different types there. Um, the reason we chose continuous uh, model is that the number of counts, even if you fix one 50 minutes interval, and if you even if you fix one spatial zoning system, on average is around like 300 or 400 or something. So these are very, very large numbers. If you wanna work with um, uh, discrete random variables like Poisson or you know negative binomial, you're looking at very, very small numbers. If you have those huge numbers, that means you need to estimate the moment generating function of a discrete random variable, which includes 300, 400, 500 parameters. That's gonna be very, very complicated. So that's why we did not go through that path. <coughs> uh, in the univariate models, there's an uh, ARIMA model here. Some of the people in the room have already worked on this. There are artificial neural networks, machine learning type, deep learning type methods huge literature there and starting to, to, to grow more and more. Conditional random fields, which are assuming that uh, all these observations are a huge multivariate Gaussian and then try to write down a specific covariance structure and estimate those covariance structures. And so I have here something uh, that, so, so this, the Moran's eye test is essentially a test that, that confirms 
the, that there is a spatial dependence over a spatial lag. So it has been already used in many, many different disciplines in transportation, and that's why I picked one uh, reference there. And then the last two, so vector autoregressive models and a spatial temporal autoregressive models. So these are the ones of, that I'm interested in. So I'm gonna introduce them one by one, and we're gonna a little bit generalize the later one, the, 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 the latter one, the star, to make it to be a little bit feasible to, to our data set, and we're gonna start the modeling there. So the whole idea, essentially, is that instead of including all these information, whether special events or other uh, different types of thing, uh, information that might affect the demand, what I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use the previous observations. So I'm gonna regress the current value on the previous values, understand this dependence over time, and then just use that to say something about the future. So this auto regressive that you see in both of these um, models are essentially telling me that I'm not bringing any additional information except just the number of counts, just the number of pickups. That, that's all I'm using here. I'll talk a little bit about the extension to where you could also include all those information, but there's a price to pay, and that's, of course, increasing the, the dimension of the parameter space. <clears throat> okay, so, so VAR models are being used a lot in different disciplines. I think it, it's originated from economics, I guess. It's econometrics and people are using it very, very, and uh, in neuroscience, I've seen many, many papers, like if you wanna try to model fMRI type data sets, you would use vector autoregressive model. And it is being used in the context of transportation in general also. But I have seen the latter one, the, the STAR model, as I here mentioned, a couple of references only. It's being used a lot in transportation type data sets, and that's why uh, we focused on this. And we, we're gonna see essentially that STAR models actually is beating vector autoregressive model for, for this uh, you know, uh, New York City yellow cap data set that we had here. It has many, many nice features, the star model, and, and many, many properties of them are still unknown. So, so VAR is much older than star. Star is, it's not in, it's a starting point, but just uh, originated maybe 1984 or five or something. So many of the uh, properties of, of this star model is still unknown to us. Okay, so I'm not sure about the time. So the data aggregation step, like I said, we do every 15 minutes. You could do one minute, two minutes. So you could do one hour, two hour, all are possible. If you do one minute, one minute, then you pr pretty much should not use continuous sending variables because you're gonna end up with only a few counts. So, and if you do one hour, two hour, then you're not gonna be able to use that model for real time prediction. So that's why we picked something in between. And the aggregation of the, of the demand is just by zip code, something that is being there, but um, I believe there's much more thing and much more deeper analysis to this in order to make that to be efficient. And this is uh, essentially the data set. So, so there are like more than 100 zip codes. Uh, I'm, I'm only uh, working on Manhattan data set. I'm not working on the other uh, boroughs and that mean, and, and the reason is that there's like a, you know, different convex far from each other and, and defining neighborhood structure from Manhattan to Queen and you know the other parts. It needs a little bit uh, assumption that might not, may not be easy to verify. So we skip those and as you, as you saw on the, on the, on the snapshot, the, the number of counts on, the Manha on Manhattan are much bigger than the rest. So that's why we focus on this. So like I said, there are more than 100 zip codes, but only, we only kept around 50 of them, and the reason is like exactly because of the fact that there are like many, many slow counts. Some of the zip codes are just one block or one building. One building means no essentially pickups, right? So that's why those we connected to the closest uh, you know, zip code, so we're not losing any counts, but we're only working with around 50 of them. So as you can see here, there's obvious uh, trend, right? I have here probably this would be, this is starting like 1 a.m. or you know midnight. 
So start getting a little bit uh, high demand in the morning, again in the evening, then again goes off, comes back. And and uh, so there's there's a trend here, as you can see. If I want to include more days, I need to start being worried about seasonality also. And on top of that, uh, even if you start removing trend as seasonality, you may see some non-stationarity behavior, especially around around these times. So assuming that nothing in the model changes over all these uh, hours in, in, in a certain day may or may not be the best assumption. So I'm going to talk about that later. Okay. So this is the ACF autocorrelation function plot of the, the data set that I, that I just showed you for like five randomly chosen zones. So autocorrelation function means like here, if you are above this threshold, and if these values are high, this means the current value is going to depend on one lag behind, two lag behinds, three, four, all the way to here, even up to 12 lags back in time, I still have some significant correlation, which means I'm, that's exactly where I'm going to start doing time series modeling. So when I see a plot like this, it's a starting point for time series analysis to start working on this data. And as you can see, so this is this just uh, this one zone with itself, but I have cross correlations, right? This is zone number two and three, and as you can see, they still have correlation, right? So you could imagine probably neighboring zones are affecting each other. If like if if there's suddenly an event somewhere, those people are going to spread out slowly, and that means the demand is going to go high in the next few minutes or hour or so in the neighboring zones. So, so essentially, it probably makes sense to observe such cross correlations. So if you only see on the diagonal terms which are significant, that means you could just treat each zip code as a separate time series model. But once you see off-diagonal elements which are significant, that means you need to do multivariate modeling. Okay, so I'm going to start explaining the, the the models, the three models, vector autoregressive. So essentially, what I have here in the formula says that I think it's probably better to to explain it in the picture. If you fix one of the one of the zip codes, the the, the, the blue one, you are thinking that all the other observations at all the other zip codes, at previous time lags, are affecting the current observation for this specific zip code. So how much was demand here 50 minutes ago? How much was demand here 50 minutes ago? How much was here? Even how much was that up there? All of them are potentially in my model are affecting the current demand. Should I go only 15 minutes or 30 minutes or 45 minutes or one hour or more? That's exactly my parameter P. P time lags in the past. P could be, if P is zero, nothing, starting P equals one, two, three, four, five, then you're going to have a dependency structure. So that's exact, uh, this P is going to exactly be related to how many time lags here I have significant, significant correlations. Right. So Y1 is going to be a linear combination of all the other elements, including Y1 itself, and then there's those coefficients for them. And these coefficients are exactly how I'm going to connect these to each other. So a linear, so the current demand is going to be a linear combination of the demand for all the other zip codes, few lags in the past. Okay, so this is essentially a VAR model. Of course, I have to include some error terms to do statistics. Otherwise, everything is going to be deterministic, right? Um, so probably normal distribution or sub-Gaussian distribution or even heavy-tailed, one might think. Okay, so in that model, like I said, phi i k superscript j quantifies the effect of the demand of the kth zone onto the ith one j steps back in time. Uh, so this parameter p of how many lags 
in the path we should go, the way people usually do in time series analysis is that you would try for different values of p and pick the one that gives you the best, whatever the best means. For us, prediction is the objective, so we try different values for p and find, uh, you know, keep the one that has the best uh, prediction error. What is interesting to show, uh, to, to note here is that we have k squared times p number parameters to estimate. So these guys are square k by k matrices, k the number of zip codes, 50. So 50 times 50, it's, it's not a small number, right? So, so 20, <coughs> 2,500 parameters, and then suppose p is like, two, three, four, five, and then you're essentially gonna have maybe 10,000 parameters. And how many data points do you have even to, to begin with? You don't have that much even data. So the amount of information that you have is smaller than the amount of parameters that you want to estimate. This is called high dimensional statistics. If the information given is less than the information you want to infer, which means here n the sample size, the number of time points for us in one day, we have 24 hours. One hour is like four observations because we have 50 minutes aggregation. So we have 96 data points. So we have around 100 data points and then we have at least 2,500 parameters. Okay, so we cannot do a typical VAR model because it's not just gonna work. So that's actually one of the drawbacks here. Too many parameters is gonna ruin uh, the model is going to do a very bad overfit, as we're going to see. And it does not probably make sense for me to believe that that guy is going to have anything to do with this guy here in the next 15 minutes. So, so why, why should I even include it in the model, right? So that's why we're going to the next step of the star model. Now, star model, similar couple of changes. The first change as the most important one is that if once you fi fix your zone, only the neighbor zone, zones are allowed to change or affect the demand. So here, I'm gonna say neighborhood number one, so I'm gonna only include these three, and I'm gonna put same weights for them. So one third from this guy, one third from this guy, one third from this guy, and a coefficient for them, let's say phi one. And then I go to the second level, neighboring. Maybe I, I include this, 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 and this, right? This, this, this should be central park, so I don't think there should be any counts there, hopefully, uh, right? So, so I'm going to include then, I have five, so I'm going to do point two, and then an, um, bring another parameter, phi two, okay? And as you can imagine, so this eta j here is essentially the number of neighborhoods that I'm gonna go. And P again, the number of time lags back, time lags, uh, back in time, that, that does not change. Okay, so I'm introducing two things here. One of them is some weightings, some weighting matrices. Here, these, my, my weighting matrices are telling me what are the, the neighboring zones. The first order neighboring zone, second order neighboring zone, third order, and so on. Here, I'm just putting all of them to be equally likely contributing to this zone, point third, right? One third here or point two there may or may not be true. So I'm gonna talk at the end about uh, future works that one could try to select these weighting matrices in different ways that might give you better performances. For the Uber data set that we worked in a different paper, actually we used demographic information to somehow define these uh, weighting matrices in a very specific way and that did actually improve the performance. Okay, so here in this star model, originated not much back in time, and so we're utilizing the neighborhood structure, right? The VAR model, you could apply it to stocks, right? It's being used in economics. There's no topology, there's no spatial structure there, but here we have it, and that's why we are uh, respecting these and quantifying these special dependence through these weighting matrices that we have here. But what's the number of parameters here? P times the number of neighborhood levels. 
if the number, no, number of neighborhood levels is just one or two, and p is also typically a very sm fairly small number, one, two, five, ten, then you end up with 20, 30 parameters, and that's on the other side of the modeling framework. It's a little bit too low. And the, the problem is that the coefficient parameters are fixed over all zones. So if I go back here, these parameters, they don't, they don't have the index i. So if this guy has an effect of 25% on this, all the first order neighborings are going to have an effect of 25%. Here, 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 or anywhere. Okay, So that's an assumption that may or may not be true. So I want to still allow for some variability of the parameters, but not going through vector autoregressive model. So that's why we go somewhere in between. So generalized submodel. Generalized submodel is the exact same thing as the star, but I'm allowing these effects to be zone dependent, right? So this is called phi one, but I have a red one here because it's zone number one. But here I have zone number two and I have different parameters. But it's still, the neighboring structures are the same. So I define my weighting matrices and every demand only is gonna depend on the few neighbors. And you go from one zone to another zone, things might change. So the model has the freedom for this parameter to change it from zone to zone. Okay. <coughs> so it's a newer version. And what is important is that how many parameters do I have here? So I have k times p. We had p times the number of neighborhoods, but then I have to multiply by kk the number of zones because these are right now zone specific. So if you look and compare G star to var, in var the number of parameters are proportional to k squared, k being the number of zones. But here it's proportional to k, not k squared. So that's, so that's the whole advantage of using G star as compared to var. So you have 50 zones, 50 is not a big number, but 50 squared is a, is a big number. Okay, so if I only work with 50 times only a couple of values for p and small neighborhood levels, this number is not going to be so high. Okay, so, so that's why generalized star models are, <coughs> are also introduced here. But it's still that, no, that number could be, could be high compared to, to my sample size, which is like less than 100. So I need to do something about it. So, uh, so the selection of the weighting matrices, like I said here, there are different ways correlation coefficient assessment. You could, if since you have this uh, spatial structure, you could think about the variogram and somehow use that variogram, which is somehow telling you the spectral density estimation and bring it here. But we did the, f the, the simplest selection, which is distance based. Okay, so I'm just looking at the first order, order adjacent matrix, second order adjacent matrix, and just look at the neighbors, second level, level neighbors, third level, and so on. So I put one if that's a neighbor, zero if it's not a neighbor, to exclude it in my modeling. And only a technical thing here that each row of your uh, weighting matrices, they should add up to one. So if you have like five neighbors, you have one, 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 five times. So you divide by five and give each of them 0.2 only. So and this, this normalization should be done in order for you to be able to estimate these parameters. Otherwise, you could here divide by five and here multiply by five and, and still get the same model, which means then this, this parameter is going to be not identifiable. Okay, so, so that's a technical term right there. So I'm going to mention a little bit about, um, so the model, as people do half of times in the statistics, at the end of the day, you write it in some sort of linear regression. Okay, so even if you do nonlinear, you again bring it to do something linear because going beyond linearity is not something mathematicians can always do. So, so I'm not going to go through the details, but trust me, you can al always write this model, all of them, var, star, g star, all of them could be written as y equals some z times some design matrix z times some uh, vector of parameters plus the error terms. 
So I could do this is squares fit, right? This is a very, very starting point of typical linear regression courses, right? They just say, okay, y minus x beta, y minus z, z phi, find the minimum there. But if, 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 if this design matrix is high dimensional, which means the number of points is more than the number of parameters, you don't, you're not gonna get, get a unique solution here. Do you remember what was the solution here? So it's like phi hat, it's like z transpose z inverse z transpose y, hopefully from your linear regression classes. That design matrix is not even inver invertible. So your z prime z does not have an inverse, which means you cannot do anything here. What people do is many, many things. One of them is somehow reduce the dimension of the parameter space. So let's say, so say yes, I want to minimize this, but at the same time, I don't want to have many, many non-zero parameters. Because I included many, many uh, flexibility in my model, but may or may not be needed, right? So I'm going to penalize. So this is called the penalty. Flow. I'm going to penalize somehow. <coughs> I'm going to say, OK, minimize the error term, but at the same time, include only 10 non-zero parameters, only 20 non-zero parameters out of 100 or 200 or 500, right? And how do I choose that 10, 20, 30? Through this tuning parameter. So it's going to be the trade-off between how much. So this is going to be my fit. That's going to be my prediction. And I have a balance between them here. Okay. <coughs> so here is actually this is going to be the part of the contribution of the paper, actually. That, so what sort of penalty for functions we should use? This the, <coughs> so you could just say, Exactly what I said just 30 seconds ago. I want exactly 20. So, so, so let's go back here. So here you just count. For a, for a given phi, you count the numbers and put it there. Unfortunately, so that, that is called L0, if you want to check in the literature. It's called the L0 penalty function. And that function is non-convex. Therefore, optimizing this going to take a long time. So there are right now dynamic programming and other techniques that uh, I don't know about them, but they are actually, actually in the literature. They're trying to a little bit speed up those techniques, but still they're much slower than convex type penalty functions. But this is a convex one. So don't count the number of zero non-zeros, but penalize on their absolute values. So each parameter put the absolute value of that parameter <coughs> there. This is, of course, a convex function, right? Absolute value function is a convex function. The, the problem is that it's not differentiable at point zero because you know the convex is the absolute value function. But non-differentiability, non-smooth is something that we could deal with, but non-convex is something computationally hard to work with. So that's a starting point. So this, this penalty was introduced by uh, <coughs> Rob Tipshirani, a famous uh, statistician at Stanford, uh, 1996, and it's being used in the statistics in many, many different places. If you just Google uh, Lasso, you're going to see a million papers, and they're going to be more and more. Trust me. And uh, <coughs> but this is a very, very starting point. No matter what model you use, any linear regression of y equals z phi, you could apply Lasso. But we wanted to do something specific to the to the model that we have here. So that's why we're defining uh, hierarchical group lasso and double hierarchical group lasso. So what are these? So these are telling me that if you, you fix one zone, zone number i, now look at the other zones, zone number j. If that zone has some effect on this five times back in the, back in the time, right, or not, may or may not have it, right? But if the effect of five times back in time is zero, probably six times back in time is also zero, because that's even more into the past, right? So probably I want to penalize more into the elements which are far back in time as compared to the ones that are really close to me. So that's why I have here something of phi j from j to p. So from 1 to p, from 2 to p, from 3 to the last, from 4 to the last, 
So the very, very last observation, the pth observation, is going to be penalized many times. But the very, very first observation is going to be penalized once only. So this is called the hierarchical group lasso. I'm grouping them in a hierarchical way, right? And I'm doing this whole function to be my penalty function. So this problem makes sense temporally because of the explanation that I just gave. And competition is also, because of this hierarchical st structure, we, we have uh, efficient implementation. And double hierarchical group lasso, which exactly the same idea that you have, but you could also, this, the, the, the previous one was temporal hierarchical, but now I want to do a spatial hierarchical. If the second level, um, if the second level neighborhood of structure has, not, has no effect, the third level should not have any effect either. Right? So I'm going to penalize the neighborhood levels are, which are far from the, my specific zone as compared to the ones which are close to me. Again, in hierarchical way. So the first order neighborhood will, will be penalized once. The tenth order will be penalized ten times. Okay, and again, the timing is the same. So I'm hierarchical in time, hierarchical in space. Okay, so I'm just going to mention only a few seconds about this, the implementation. The implementation, like I said, you have something which is very nice, but smooth, convex, whatever you like, and you have something that is convex but not non-differentiable. Uh, so there are different methods, gradient methods. What we have picked here is the proximal method. That first you start somewhere, go through the uh, through the derivative of your function, but then because of this additional effect that you here you have, you need to apply some function to it, which is the proximal function. And uh, what is so so this is very simple. The, the derivative of this function is already given here. But the step that has something to do with the penalty, you need to be worried about it. If you, you cannot put any penalty that you like because then this proxy operator may or may not be known. But you typically want to work with penalties which you know exactly for which what is the proxy. Here, if you do only simple lasso, all hierarchical or double hierarchical, these proxy functions are completely known. So I don't need to numerically approximate it again. Okay, it's because I already have one layer of approximation. If this one is also another layer of approximation, maybe I need to wait a few minutes to get my convergence. Right? But these are exact. Okay, so I have here a couple of a couple of references which are gonna help you to to <coughs> understand a little bit more about it. But so so the, the story, the moral of the story is that put penalty functions which are fast. And we actually did another trick, which is uh, this FISA trick that was generated, uh, was uh, introduced a few years back. And that, let me just explain about it because it might be uh, interesting. So typically, if you want to do, you want to do optimization method, you will start with some initial value, typically go through the, the derivative and do some tricks. And then hopefully, if, if you have a Cauchy sequence, if points are close to each other, then you will stop and that's where you think you have your convergence. And typically, the current observation is going to be the previous one, plus or minus some constant. So here, the previous observation plus some derivative, and then apply something to it. And But then these people came up with a nice trick. And they say that, OK, look at your, your current estimation is not only a function of the previous one but it's a function of the last two. So you have r minus one, and your r step, and then r minus two also. And with some specific weights, right? This is just a linear combination of the last two. So a very simple trick, very, very simple trick. Don't use only the last one, use the linear combination of the last two. And they can show that the convergence is of the order one over n squared as compared to one over n. And we actually, I actually implemented this because I wanted to see if this is really true or not. Well, theoretically, of course, but I wanted to see if really is is making any changes or not, and it does. So this one maybe need like 30 replicates to to reach conver uh, convergence, but this one like three or four. 
So it's a huge reduction. This, this paper is getting you know cited many many times, like it's like 800 or 900 or even more, which for that subject is a, is a huge number. So <clears throat> so that might be a trick that might be useful for your own projects to speed up the the convergence. Okay, so said enough. Uh, so if you remember, we had the lambda tuning parameters that uh, I'm, I'm using. So we need to somehow approximate that. Theory tells us something about it, but we want data-driven methods. So what we do is that we split the data into three parts, 0 to t1, t1 to t2, t2 to t. We do the fit here. We do out-of-sample out of prediction here for different values of lambda. And we pick the one, pick one lambda that gives us the best prediction, which is the minimum prediction error. What I mean by prediction error, how much? This much. Mean of square prediction error. How, how much is exactly your data point? What's your prediction? Square them, average them. Okay. So this is called the rolling scheme. There are different ways of uh, uh, finding parameters, tuning parameters. This is the one that, since we have temporal, seems to be the best fit. Okay, so we used a couple of days in October 2015 as the data. We fixed P to be one, only one time like back. There's a reason for it. So we use AAC, BAC type. We normalize the data and then we use at most five neighborhood levels. So if you use only one data, this is for only one neighborhood. One neighborhood means only the data itself, the, the zone itself, no neighborhood structure. It equals two, three, and four. So we have different ways measurements. Mean of square prediction error means a relative prediction error, and then AIC, BIC types. And as you can see, depending on what you want, uh, you, you could choose different method, different models to be the best. But what is important is that the VAR model is really doing really bad compared to a star. So we have like 1.7 and then dramatically reduced to 0.28. And this 0.28 could be also, so if you look at star models, you could do lasso, you could do hierarchical lasso, you could do double hierarchical lasso. And typically, doing this double hierarchical lasso reduces the, the mean of square prediction error. Okay. So, <clears throat> so first of all, these results are telling me that neighborhood structures are in fact important. So one, two, three, four even. We, we did not feel that we need to go beyond five because it was almost getting, uh, you know, stable. And so using different penalty functions are helping. So sometimes for eta equals three, it reduces the prediction by 3%, but if you go eta four, it's 17%. The more neighborhood structure that you have, the better this, these penalty functions are gonna show themselves. So if you have big numbers of neighborhood structures, it's gonna be better in terms of, uh, distinguishing between lasso, HG lasso, and DHG lasso. So these are the leaf charts. Uh, the leaf charts are, uh, so this is for the VAR model. These are for all these different models. So they sh they're supposed to be, so leaf chart means the actual data, your predicted value. They, of course, they should be, in the ideal case, exactly on the 45 degrees line, but of course, that does not happen always. If you see, us, there's a little bit of, you know, like a shift here, right? It's supposed to be like this, but they're like this. The reason is that all these penalized methods are biased. So when you when you include when you bring the penalty functions, you're not going to be unbiased. You're not going to have unbiased estimators, but instead you're going to have biased estimators. So that bias is actually here in the slope of the, all these. But they have really good properties, so that's why people are still use them. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so I'm going a little bit fast here and finish hopefully in five minutes. Um, so let's say, and they say, let's include two days of data. Since we have more and more data points, let's say around 200 data points, now the differences between lasso, HG lasso, DH lasso are going to be smaller and smaller. If you have 10,000 data points, with these small number of zip codes, only 40, 50, they're gonna be all the same. So if you really wanna see the effect of different, different penalty functions, you should be really working with high dimensional. High dimensional means the number of zip codes of the order 1,000 
the number of observations of the order may be a few hundred or more. Okay? But even in, in two days, we are looking at five neighborhood structures giving us the best uh, prediction performance, which tells essentially that star is, is beating var g, star is beating a star, and <clears throat> you don't need to go all the way to, if you want to work with lower s, you don't need to go all the way with, to the upper west. You only work with four or five neighborhood levels. Right. So I've got here the lift charts again. This is slightly better for HG lasso and D and DHG lasso compared to a star. Right? It feels a little bit more aligned to align. <coughs> okay, so benefits of star type modeling. So I'm reducing the parameter space, getting better per prediction performance. Interpretation of these parameters. So VAR model in general and star models. These parameters, phi, i, j, k, whatever, all those subscript and superscript, they're very easy to interpret. The effect of the i's zip code and the j's zip code, case time back in time, case steps back in time. Not all the, mess, all the models, they have such nice interpretations. Because once you do the fit, you really want to see if this, if this fit makes sense or not. So we did goodness of fit tests here, and they all passed that. But in order for this model to really make sense to practitioners, if we have models which are easily uh, interpretable, it's going to be very important. And that's exactly why we chose these three models. <coughs> so I talked about the fast implementation because of the specific type of penalty that we use. What is also interesting here to mention is that no matter how you want to model, if you want to bring a spatial and temporal dependence, you need to somehow write down some covariance metrics. Whatever the covariance matrix is between all the zip codes together. And that covariance matrix needs to be positive definite. So whatever you want to write, you need to make sure that all the assumptions are true. But if you write it through this model, you don't need to check it every time whether your model is positive definite or not. It has to be. Okay, so it's a very efficient way of uh, introducing different special temporal models. So just a couple of plots for this specific zip code. I have first layer, third, second and third layer of neighborhood. As you can see, for different, so I'm allowing uh, for different zip codes to have different levels of neighborhood. So I'm not putting all of them to be like five. I'm putting the maximum to be five, and then if the if the coefficient, if the third coefficient for this is zero, that means starting third and fourth and fifth neighborhoods, nothing, right? Because we have hierarchical structure. So this neighborhood structure is actually much better than var, right? If I wanted to do var, I just had to put everything except few that were set to zero maybe by lasso. So a couple of more here. There are like more of this into in the paper. I prefer not to mention there, but I'm just going to mention a couple of things here. What if you want to go beyond the sessionarity, which means what if these parameters phi, phi j's, somehow are time dependent? Can you make that happen? Right? What if we allow all the parameters to change over time? If you want all the parameters to change over time, that's too much to ask. If you allow all the parameters to change, you don't have much data to do any sort of estimation. So in statistics, they call it identifiability issues. So we cannot even identify the parameters nicely. But that's too much. What if we ask something in between? What if parameters change in piecewise manner? So from morning up to 6 AM, one parameter, from 6 to 5 p.m., another parameter, from 5 to midnight, the third parameter. Can I make that happen? So the answer is, well, of course, under some assumptions, yes. But then how do I pick those values, 6 a.m., 5 p.m., right? So I have here a plot from a different paper that is about breakpoint detection. So we try to, given, so this is actually the plot of the, of the data, the yellow cap data. You remember that thing? So you need to do the differencing first make sure everything looks nice. And then, so we applied different techniques to identify exactly where are those discontinuity points. And in fact, we found a couple of them. Okay, so this is previously mentioned method. This is, was our method. See 7 a.m., 8, 10, 6, 7 p.m. 
So close to rush hours, morning rush hours and evening rush hours, there seems to be some discontinuity behavior. Discontinuity behavior does not mean the behavior changes in the mean. Of course, there's more demand and there's less demand. But you, when you do the differencing once, you're killing all that. So when I see these numbers and these breakpoints, it means all these matrices, phi's, they actually change. So essentially, these covariance matrices among zip codes, they are changing. And I, ha I don't have one, I, I actually have three. If I include put all of them as one, keep all of these as one. Okay, so it's starting, so this, we started thinking about this later, so this is a very recent paper. And we realized that many of the papers in the literature which are assuming a stationarity, which means nothing changes, they need to revisit, including ours. Okay, so, so now what if we have this structure, what can we do? How can we use this to do something better, right? So of course we are starting doing that, but not the story for today's talk. So let me summarize. Uh, so we did a special temporal modeling for yellow uh, cap demand in New York City, we use neighborhood structure, and we use uh, penaliz penalization methods to do uh, efficient implementa implementation. This could be, since it's so fast, it could be uh, replicated in real time, and it could be used in practice. And, but breakpoint detection is something that we need to take a look further. And for the future work, there are many, many more things to work on, right? What if we want to do different prediction for different times of the day? What if you wanted to include informations like demographic, demand of other public transportations, weather and other things into the model or into the weighting matrices, what can happen? Different penalties, different days. If you want to bring different days, you need to take care of seasonalities, which is might sound easy, but it's not actually always like very easy. And this is something that I, th this would be like my dream project. What if you want to include everything together? So bring subway, Uber, whatever you have, bike, and somehow find all these cross correlations. So you have cross correlation over time, over space, and over all these different uh, public transportation. So that may happen in, not in the next month, but maybe in the next five years. Right. So thank you so much for the attention. Let me stop here. These are 15 minutes, and uh, yes, we only do one time ahead. The model allows for more. I think we did uh, for like three or four also. Mm -hmm. So in terms of comparison of the MSPE, mm -hmm. it's still like a start type mo models are beating okay. bar. But then start, it's, it's gonna start getting a little bit worse, okay. of course. So uh, just out of curiosity, suppose that you have uh, more data and you can predict for the next, let's say, 15 minutes. Would it be possible to detect some patterns over that uh, over, over the next 15 minutes? Like, will it be a Markov process or whatever? I mean, like a model that you can uh, So, you, did you mention 16 minutes instead of 15? 16. 60 minutes. Zero, one hour. Yes, yes, yes. So, one hour. So, yes. You could, uh, so like I said, yeah, all of these models are allowing to do many, many steps ahead mm -hmm. prediction, but even for even univariate case, suppose you have only one zip code and it only depends on the previous values of itself. Do whatever model, autoregressive model you want. And if you wanna predict one step, it's gonna do good. 10 steps, okay, 50, 1,000, it's just gonna give you the mean, the sample mean. It's the same thing is gonna happen here. Okay. So in all of these techniques, if you wanna predict 10 days ahead, the, the best thing you could do is just do the sample average for each zip code itself. Because all these cross correlations, they are decreasing geometrically with the distance. So all of them are gonna vanish and be gone. 
so four steps, like one hour is still, you're, you're gonna do good, okay, but not as good as like 15 minutes. But that's the nature of any, I would say, statistical model. Sure. Great question. Uh, I have a question about the, how you find the neighborhoods uh, mm -hmm. of the model. So mm -hmm. are you looking at adjacent zones, uh, or is it does it think that kind of yeah, so we just looked at the, so by like looking at it to see which ones. Uh, you could uh, look at the center of each zip code and do a distance based, but the one that we picked by looking at, carefully looking at the at the neighborhood structure worked better. But there, like I said, there are different ways you could uh, define these neighborhoods. What is What was important that we saw in, in an, another project for the Uber data that if you bring all this demographic inf type information, like the income and other types that we do have for, you know, yeah. for, so, so those are actually quite helpful. And one, another thing that since you mentioned, here I have for different ways to do weighting matrices, what about if we do directional? So for the morning, probably everything going down, right, to go to work, probably in the evening, they're going back up. So I could choose my neighborhood structure exactly directional, going south or going north. So they could all be, and they could, right? I can use uh, this sort of breakpoint detection, and my weighting matrices could be also, they could also have discontinuity points. So here, here, and here. So I think those are really good directions for future research. And I see uh, even publication that they only focus on weighting matrix selection. So the modeling part is fixed, nothing there. So there's much more to be done there. Uh, another follow-up question. <coughs> So you only consider Manhattan, yes, yes. So so we could uh, as long as so there are two reasons why we only focus on Manhattan. One of them is that if you want to include everything, you want to include many, many zip codes which are which have almost like zero counts. And that that's just gonna ruin the model. Uh, but of course, you could just focus on the like airports or like major parts of like Queens or Brooklyn or other parts. It's actually possible, but then the neighborhood structure they need to be properly defined. So probably, so since these are really disjoint, one question is that do I really need to model them together, or just do the major parts of Brooklyn separate from Manhattan? Is that gonna add any value or not? So for that reason, we did not include it, but that's a very good question. They, they, might, they may have some connections. I just got one question, that's actually two. Yeah. So for the Sinalize uh, yes. method, we're using the Russell. Yes. And um, I just want to know, because there are also many, like the Latin mass and all this kind of stuff. Yes. So when you do like yes. the, choosing the method, what is the standard of use? Because the Lasso is kind of like some I mean, computational heavy, is that, it? I mean, except for the hierarchy. Uh, well, of course, hierarchical ones are even more than just a typical lasso, so they're more involved. Uh, but, so if I find these structures here. So, elastic net is a combination between lasso and L2 norm. And so, it's different discussions like I said, you could put L0, which is just counting the number of uh, uh, parameters, which is non-convex, so we wanna put that aside. You could put L2 norm squared, right? And that actually has closed form, actually. So you don't even need to do any optimization method. You do just do closed form. But why not people are using it? The reason is that it does not set the parameters to zero. It will decrease them but never sets them to zero. And therefore, not useful. I have 2,500 parameters, I still have 2,500 parameters. The, their values are smaller. That's not gonna help me. So the reason we use lasso is that it has, um, there's something, they, they call it variable selection consistency or oracle properties. So they can show that with high probability, if the parameter is zero in the model, which means this zone and this zone, they have nothing to do with each other, Asymptotically speaking, I can my parameter also is going to converge to zero, and that is being proved for lasso. So that's why many many people are using that. But again, 
the different ways. So you could do uh, elastic net also. We did not try it. It may it may help. It may help. I'm not gonna say that it will not. It may help with the. But I think it's gonna then. It's gonna be slower than lasso, of course, because you have two penalties. You have some portion from lasso, and then you have some portion from the L2. Not that is slower, of course. So instead of two seconds, maybe three seconds. So still doable. But like I said, I want to do this for not one day, for maybe five years of data, and for all the data set that are available in the literature. So I want to pick something that is very, very efficient and very fast. So if the number of the permutations that you need to mention is larger than the number of concerns, you're going to be like select only one variable for the lasso, right? That is a known drawback of the model. It's not going to select only one. I mean, at least at, least at the end. Uh, no, no, no. It doesn't have to be. No. So it, it, it totally depends on that lambda. Yeah, the lambda part, yeah. It totally depends on this lambda. Mm -hmm. If it would lambda to be infinity, all the parameters are zero. If it would lambda to be zero, all the parameters are non zero. So you just choose something in between. And so theoretically, we have some rate mm -hmm. that should converge to zero, but with certain rate. But practically, People usually do some sort of out of sample cross co cross uh, you know <coughs> cross validation techniques here. So what we did here was uh, you know making three parts and try to find the best prediction. So but people do different like you know k folds you know split your data into ten parts every time take nine predict the tenth one right. We did not go through that path because we have a time access we have future. I don't want to predict the past, that's not gonna help me. I just wanna do efficient prediction for the future. So that's why we use this. But no, this totally, as you start increasing or decreasing this lambda, the number of parameters could be zero all the way to all non-zero. It's not gonna be more than n or less than or equal to n. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are you using your yellow or yellow plus? No, this is just yellow. Okay. Yes, yes. So the data set that we started working was just for the yellow. Okay. Yeah. Second question is, uh, how are you handle the, the scales? Because they are, they are shifting period all of both ends, and you write them for the possible quantity. Oh, like exact points? Yeah, they're like different uh, data mining sets. You know, if specifically like locations. If that location is too close to the boundary of zip point number, zip code number 27 or 28, do you want to include them into this one or that one? So. Uh, Sabia, the, the, the PhD student actually took care of that. Uh, but we, so what we saw that sometimes we're counting things twice. So we need to, you know, go deep and make sure that when things are close to the boundary, we, we do not count them, both temporally and both, you know, spatially. Uh, so it's a little bit of a subject type, you know, judgments that you just have to decide. Do you think this is, you should keep this closer to, you know, this zip code or that zip code? But what is important is that don't count things twice. So we made sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, thank you for a quick presentation. Sure. Um, you use the VR model as the baseline model. Do you think it is possible to use the collision model regressive? Uh, yeah. yeah, one might think of that also. I actually started thinking about that model, but then we moved to, to vector or regressive model because Car models and like SAR models, you know, simultaneous autoregress model, they they were not as popular as VAR models in the in the in the demand, you know, estimation and prediction into literature. So that's why we start working with this. And it probably one reason if I want to guess is that the parameters are interpretable. And it's not the case for the car or SAR model. So that makes sense. And there are a couple of parameters in the car model that people don't know how to interpret. So they say it's connected to spatial dependence, but then people have papers that say, no, it's not. So it's a little bit iffy in that side. Is that implemented in the Bayesian setting? Uh, it doesn't have to be implemented in Bayesian. I don't think it has anything to do with Bayesian. You could do frequent frequencies also. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.